So I'm going to start off somewhat at the very beginning of what ethics is. I found a lot of the times, especially when we're speaking about the ethics of ODR, we focus so much on ODR, we overlook the ethics portion of it. Um, so ethics is concerned with the values, issues of right and wrong, and what we owe each other as persons. One of the more important aspects of it, especially with ODR that's so new, or at least its explosion is so new, is what, how do we identify when an ethical issue comes up? Um, and there are three typical ways. The first is the ick factor or that feeling in your stomach that just something's wrong, something's not right. The second one is if there's uncertainty or a disagreement about what ought to be done. That is the classic way we think about an ethical issue. And the third is if dignity or fairness is, is at stake. It's good to kind of keep those three things in mind because the reality is ethics is very new with ODR and the theory is very, there's a lot of work that we need to do. Um, and I know a lot of people are working on the standards and the codes um, and there are some templates coming out. Um, I know mediate.com has a working group out to put out actually a much larger comprehensive report, um, which is supposed to be coming out this month. Um, I mean, IMI is working on this new ethical codes of conduct. Um, in Canada, we're doing the same. So there's going to be a lot of changes coming up in the future. Um, but the problem with just relying on codes of conduct and codes of ethics is that it doesn't always help you when those standards are conflicting with each other, or even at the moment when you're doing a mediation, especially if it's ODR, as we get more experience, there's going to be more and more ethical issues coming up right at the moment when we're doing the mediation that just looking over and looking at standards and codes may not really be able to help us too much. So it's important to recognize the how you recognize ethical issues so that you can end up working through them and actually notice them in the first place, essentially. Now, of course, to actually notice them, you need to be able to know a little bit about ODR. So just to do a quick run through, um, ODR really started back in the 90s when the internet took off, especially with commercial disputes. Um, it, the general idea was that we didn't really need face-to-face -face interaction to deal with conflict, um, especially with commercial disputes through any sort of online mechanism because they were, well, there's a lot of them. They typically were low value, just some sort of commercial complaint. Um, and it was all cross borders, cross jurisdictional. You couldn't just bring people together to work something out. So there needed to be a different way of addressing the problem. Um, and that's essentially how ODR began, was this adaptation of trying to find software that could help work through conflicts that basically were all coming up online where you couldn't do something face-to-face. -face. And that is basically where the term the fourth party began. So the fourth party is a metaphor for how software can substitute for human in a lot of ADR mechanisms and processes. Um, and we see that a lot. The most common ones are email, um, it's the one we've been using for a really long time. So in that, in that way, ODR has been around for a very long time. But the thing that really brought everyone's attention to it is Zoom, video conferencing like we're on now. That's been the really big thing uh, because it seems to be the part that kind of can go wrong the most obviously for us, especially when everyone started using it and things were sort of falling apart. And nobody really knew how to get everything working at the very, be the very beginning. Um, and the thing is, when we're using these programs, when we're using these fourth parties, they essentially become our partner. Um, we become, in a way, responsible for them as long as we have control over them. Um, but this is also just the very beginning. Where this goes in the future is very, actually kind of scary in a way. Um, I mean, if you think about the things that AI can do, if you get into quantum computing, which I'm not going to get into, but if you think about where technology can go, there's a lot of things can be replaced when it comes to dispute resolution. So if we think of the very basic sort of simple complaints, eBay processes over 60 million complaints cases annually um, without a person involved. It's all automated systems and they resolve about 80% of them. So they already have a system that's been around for decades now. Um, they've been doing that really well. And if you look at the influence AI has had or other technologies right now, 
um, IBM's Watson AI system is responsible for doing a lot of legal research, case research. Um, you can go online and get documents written up that are completely legally binding, again, without a person necessarily being involved. So if we start thinking about moving forward, the influence that AI may have could actually hit a point where we're basically co-mediating with an AI program. Um, that all said, that is somewhat further in the future. We aren't living in sort of a dystopian future where AI is controlling everything quite yet. So at the moment, we still have control over the fourth parties that we're working with. And that's what I want to focus on mostly in this talk, because those are the things we're going to be facing right away. We still have control over Zoom. We have control over our emails and we have control over saving to what we save our um, um, files to anything on the cloud or anything like that. So for the most part, we still have control over what we're doing. So the ethical problems are slightly different now than the people who sort of think really far into the future where we're gonna have even less control and we're thinking more about who actually is developing the programs, what are the programs that we use and sort of really forward thinking when you get too far in the future. So right now, what most people are doing is, as I mentioned, developing new stoves, codes and standards and ethics for how we're actually supposed to interact with these fourth parties, because that is sort of the core of what ODR ethics are. With that said, I'm going to, while they haven't been fully developed, I'm going to get into some of what I think are the most important codes and standards that are currently being thought up, um, especially the difference between what it was like traditionally with normal ADR, straightforward ADR when you're just doing it all in person, or ODR. So the first one I think is competence. Um, traditionally, it's just been related to the mediator's quality at mediation. Um, are they trained? Do they have the experience? Do they have the skills and the cultural understanding to satisfy the expectations of the parties involved um, throughout the mediation? Do you have that knowledge to be able to do it? That was really what competence used to be focused on the most, but now it's moved into the technological realm too. So does the mediator know and understand how to use the technology? Are they using the best technology? Are they using, do they understand the different risks and benefits that are involved, with whatever the program is that they're using? These are all things we're going to need to start considering. We're not start considering, we need to be considering um, if we're really going to be using a, a very ethical process when it comes to mediation. And there's two reasons why I think competence is really the most important one. The first is practical. If you don't know how to use the technology, you're not going to be able to mediate. Um, whether it's just getting everything going and actually following through with the mediation or keeping the quality of the mediation up. Uh, and because if you can't use the technology, the reality is a lot of other ethical issues are going to start arising throughout the process. That one's pretty straightforward. The second one may be a little bit less. So. I think ethic, uh, competency is the most ethically important um, component of ODR ethics because you need to be competent with the technology to understand the risks and the benefits of that technology. And subsequently, that means you need to be able to understand the technology to understand the risks and benefits of the entire ODR process. Um, and without that, you won't be able to identify the ethical issues that come up or find ethical solutions. So sometimes identifying a ethical problem in ODR is relatively straightforward because it's similar to a previous ethical issue. So if we think about something like accessibility, um, traditionally, we always would try to make it fair. If you thought about somebody meeting in a room to do a mediation, but one of the parties was in a wheelchair and the room was at the top of a staircase, that would be something that would be a very obvious accessibility issue. Um, we'd be able to recognize that. Similarly, the transfer over to, if you're doing a mediation with ODR and you find out somebody is living in, I'll use Canada as an example, in Northern Ontario, the province I'm in, a lot of people don't have internet or at least not very good internet. So if you know somebody's living in Northern Ontario, there's a chance there's gonna be a power imbalance created by the inaccessibility of a proper internet connection. Um, because you don't want that constant lag. You don't want the person not to be able to share their story or find it really hard to share their story because they keep getting cut off. Um, really impacts the quality of the whole process. 
and that one is something that I think is a bit easier to identify because it's something that we can recognize because it can be so similar and, and comparable to what was happening before. Where the importance of competence in identifying ethical issues in ODR is particularly important is when the ethical issue is ingrained in the technology itself. So I'm going to use the classic example of passwords. We've all been told at some point that we should not use passwords to have our name in them, our date of birth. We should try to change them regularly. Um, and those are all very important things, yet a lot of people still don't do it. A lot of us still keep the exact same passwords. We use the same passwords for every, um, every account that we have. Um, and they're usually short using our name. Maybe we've added a few symbols as we've been required to, but for the most part, that's what we use. Um, and I think when I've talked to people about it, one of the things that typically comes up is the fact that they just don't necessarily think it's an urgent thing. Um, you know, you have your password, it's protecting you enough as it is. But the reality is the more you look into ideas of cybersecurity, the more you realize it, it actually is very important. Um, so the reason they say not to use your name, change them regularly and use different ones per account is because using, I mean, we all have scams coming up where somebody obviously tells you to download something that you don't want to download and you don't. Um, but everything's getting complicated enough that if you get a new malware or if you're a victim of a phishing scam, which is basically when somebody pretends to be somebody else or somebody you know to get you to download something, you get something on your computer that can basically steal a lot of your data. And on the other side, even if you have a strong password, if you're using something like Microsoft or Google and Microsoft or Google get hacked, then somebody can get all of your information from that, even if you have a strong password, which is why it's important to keep switching it up. Um, and this is getting really common. So in January 2019, hackers released 2.2 billion usernames and passwords for free on the dark web. 2.2 billion is a lot of usernames and passwords. And the fact that they did it for free at the time was unheard of. Um, but it also shows about how access accessible and how easy it is to actually start getting people's usernames and passwords now. And if somebody has that, then they can basically just start trying those passwords and usernames on any main internet platform. Because if we reuse our passwords a lot, at some point they're going to hit something. And the way that a lot of our accounts are connected now, or if you do use the same password for a lot of different accounts, if they can find one, a lot of the times they can connect to everything. Um, so the classic example is Facebook ran into a lot of trouble because you can log into so many different accounts now with Facebook that if somebody hacks into your Facebook account, then they get access to everything that you have connected to that account. So the reason I used that somewhat long explanation is just to say before I knew that, I didn't necessarily take the idea of needing to change my password and having very an important process around that, all that seriously. But when I found that out, I got that feeling in my stomach that it's like something was ethically wrong if I didn't take this more seriously. Because one of the tenets of ethics and mediation is confidentiality. We usually start mediations by saying that this is a confidential process. But unless we can actually be sure that we're doing our best to keep things secure in the online environment when we are using ODR, it's difficult to say we're actually fulfilling that requirement. Um, it is so different now that we used to get hard copies of briefs or mediation summaries, um, depending on the type of mediation you're doing before, but now they're emailed to us. Um, and a lot of times we'll just kind of keep them on our email system. Um, a lot of the times we'll ask, the, I've, the amount of times I've had people send me mediation information accidentally, and then they have to hope that I, you know, delete it properly and make sure I get it rid of it, everything, just because it's so easy to slip up and, and break that rule of confidentiality now that we need to be very confident. And we also need to be able to recognize and be competent enough in how the technology works that we can identify where these gaps might exist uh, while we're dealing with it in real time. So that 
is a long way about going about why I think competence is, is the most important. It's just a practical step, but also without understanding competence and really having that competence in using the technology, it'll be more difficult for us to understand these new ethical problems and as they come up, um, and they will, just as we get more and more experience, um, we're going to just keep finding new and new ethical issues that we'll need to work through. Second one is going to be confidentiality, which I, well, I guess I sort of discovered for the most part. Um, again, traditionally, we had hard copies. We would talk in closed rooms. We just would promise not to tell people about it later. And that's really all you need to do. But now you need to have some sort of knowledge about cybersecurity to make sure that people's information is protected and have a process involved to make sure it stays protected. The third one is self-determination and informed participation. So this idea is that participants can make their own choices about how a mediation process will proceed. Um, traditionally, this was, you know, you told the parties about your style of mediation. Is it facilitative? Is it evaluative? Is it transformative? You try to agree on the location and that was a large part of it. But now it's not only style of mediation and not just location. It's also how are you going to communicate? Um, what email are you using? Um, what type of email? How good is the security of that platform? Um, how are the documents going to be saved? How are they going to be sent? Um, how it familiar is everybody with the technology being used? Um, again, in the way ODR changes ethics, um, it doesn't really change the ethics. It's just, it's a totally new environment. It adds an entirely new dimension of what we're going to be able to need to learn to be able to navigate. Um, now, the trickiest part with this is what makes an informed participant. So coming from a medical ethics background, informed consent in Canada um, is one of the biggest things in medicine. Um, and there are three key requirements to make sure a doctor obtains informed consent because they're not allowed to do any sort of process or any sort of procedure until they get that from the patient. So the first is that it must be voluntary. The second is that it must be informed which again is one of those vague terms that basically says what a reasonable, pers reasonable person would expect to know. Typically it's summarized as they're told what is going to be done, the benefits, the risks, the risks of not doing it, and then any alternative options. If we were to translate that into mediation, it would be what software we're we gonna be using, what are the benefits of the mediation and the software, what are the risks, what are the risks of not using it? Um, I bring that one up particularly because I found the more I think about this, if there's an issue of quality of mediation, you also have to balance it out with the risk of not doing the mediation at all. Um, in conflict, naturally, when we're brought in, there are problems we don't want persisting. Um, and sometimes it's worth risking a, a lower quality mediation if it means in that scenario, you can still make some sort of progress to help people through that conflict. And then finally, any alternative options? Is it possible to do an in-person if everybody is, or if there is a power and difference based on um, quality of internet connection, for example? And then finally, the person must be capable of giving consent. Um, ideally, they aren't drunk or having some sort of problem that really influences their ability to say yes. And I think this aspect is something we also need to start taking more consideration in. Um, especially when self-determination, at least in the literature, is becoming a more prominent aspect of mediation as people start recognizing that the idea of impartiality, which has sort of been the basis of a lot of mediation, may not necessarily be possible, we may not be able to be fully impartial people. Um, so a lot of ethical liter literature is starting to move in the direction that in the absence of this impartiality, the best thing we can do is try to get as be as open and transparent with our participants as we can. And if they agree to come still work with us, then we're okay. It helps balance out um, some of the inevitable issues that might arise from not being as impartial as we sometimes like to think we are just based on the more literature that comes out with unconscious bias, for example, um, just speaks to how difficult it really is to be truly impartial. Um, if you keep going down this road, the problem you end up running to again comes to the competency side. Um, what is our responsibility to teach people about the technology? Um, it's not really our role to, to become cybersecurity experts or technology experts, but at the same time, you would expect we'd have to have 
at least enough knowledge about it that we could make sure we can get informed consent from the participants in terms of moving forward if they're really going to be informed participants. And the next is accessibility. Again, I've sort of touched on that again. I realize this talk, for me at least, a lot is it's coming from a Western perspective. Um, the more I've talked to people internationally, accessibility is a, maybe a bigger issue there than often comes up here just because of Wi-Fi acceptability, um, accessibility, uh, what kind of technology is actually available. Uh, I mean, a lot more people have smartphones and computers. How does that influence things? And does everybody understand how to use it? I mean, there are just such a diverse amount of, of access to technology that, well, I, I found a lot of people who have the technology, we have it easily accessible, also tend to underestimate how many people don't. And that's something I think we need to keep remembering when we're talking about OVR, when we're talking about ODR ethics, the fact that not everybody actually has access to these different things. So this is sort of just a general list of, on the left, you've got the classic ADR ethics codes that come up, things you need to worry about. And on the right, I guess middle and right, are a lot of the ones that have been pitched for ODR ethics. A lot of them overlap. Um, but there are certainly a lot more things that are starting to come under consideration for this. So it's going to be a very loaded, it's going to be a very interesting time going forward. Uh, I'm not going to get into all of these, obviously, because there's quite a lot. Um, I've spoken to the ones that I think are most important. Hopefully, we have a discussion a little bit later. Um, I can get some feedback about what other people think, especially from such an international um, group. This, I'd be really interested to know how things are going everywhere else, really. Um, one of the big things I want people to take from this is the fact that even when standards and codes come in, especially when we get those ethical codes and these reports, it doesn't really mean we're out. It, it doesn't mean we're in the clear. Um, the reality is despite working in, when I was working in medicine, one of the, I mean, ethics is one of the most academically focused when it comes to medicine, um, it's it's everywhere, and the literature is extensive, and they have codes of conducts and codes of ethics and everything at every different level of medicine. But they still need bioethicists because the reality is a lot of these different codes conflict with each other. What do you do when one code of ethics and another code of ethics run into each other? Um, <laughs> it's 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 that's the hardest thing to try to sort out. Um, and it's one of the reasons I have a job. But it's something we need to keep considering throughout this process, because again, in real time, we're all going to be dealing with new ethical issues that appear. So for me, even two weeks ago, I had a mediation that had some ethical issues come up that I never even considered, and I'd already been working on this talk for a month. Um, so for me, I was working in a medical clinic, conflict between two first party laws, which the part of me that still likes traditional in-person mediation felt that that somehow would take away from the process because in person you are forced to sort of be in a big room where there's no distractions. That's exactly what this is going to be. You can see the person's body language. You can see um, the different sort of nonverbal communication that's happening and you can't just sort of look out the window. You, you're stuck there. Um, whereas ODR, you're already on a smaller screen. And I mean, that's one of the biggest complaints about ODR is from traditionalists who sort of feel that this interaction takes a lot away from it, which I don't necessarily think is a bad thing. I don't necessarily think it takes away from it too much. But at the same time, I do recognize that if you're just working on the screen, it's very different than being there in person. And if you'd have a really small screen, then you would expect that takes away even more, um, especially if you're actually doing the mediation, you have to either rotate between one person taking up the whole screen or even smaller faces um, sharing it half and half. It's hard for me to picture that being as beneficial of even using a laptop. When the other party logged in, they were using a laptop and they had a webcam, but they didn't really know how to use any of it. And they were sitting on a box because they were in the workplace and had to sort of go somewhere separate. Um, which again, isn't a particularly comfortable position for them to find themselves in. It could also impact the mediation. Then halfway through the mediation, the headset 
that the party with the laptop was using disconnected. She didn't know how to connect it back in, but the walls were so, so thin, she knew the laboratory next door could basically hear the entire mediation. So what she had to do was turn the volume all the way down on her computer and spent the second half of the mediation with her head down to the keyboard with her ear to the speaker. Again, not a very strong way to kind of go through mediation. But the reason I kept going with it, despite the fact that the quality sort of kept going down as we kept going, was because the risks outweighed, or the benefits of continuing with the mediation outweighed the risks of not doing it at all. Um, in that case, there were um, complaints, no real evidence, but complaints and mentions of physical violence that was going on. They were going to go right back into the workplace together. Uh, they were going to need to interact. It was impacting the rest of the workforce. And considering how serious their relationship was impacting everything, I didn't feel it would have taken a lot for me to stop that mediation, um, even though there were, again, issues of accept, um, accessibility. Maybe if more power dynamics had come up, I would have stopped it. But considering the technological challenges seem to be pretty balanced on both sides, the power dynamic wasn't as important. Um, but I kept going with it because I felt it was more important to continue. And I think that's going to be one of the big things that comes up a lot, especially while we're doing mediations, is we're going to find more and more challenges that arise. And one of the big questions we're going to have to face is, all right, at what point do I actually stop this mediation as this kind of keeps breaking down? Um, and there are so many different ways that this can happen. Um, I mean, because if something does happen, because we're so far, it's hard to help somebody with the technology. It took me about 10 minutes to try to help some um, help the party figure out how to shrink down the Zoom screen so that she could connect the headset and actually link it with the headset again. And I could tell while I was trying to help her with this, the other party was starting to get distracted because all she had was the like the little screen. So we started looking out the window and started getting frustrated. Then I started getting frustrated because I couldn't figure out why the party was having so much trouble with this, um, which they started creating a bias for myself. Um, and these are just things that we need to do more as experience gets on. Um, but we always need to be asking ourselves, at what point do we step away from the mediation uh, based on what the risk is if we, if we actually stop compared to the benefits that we could get, even if we go through with a, with a quality one or one where the quality isn't quite as high as we would like. Okay, so actually before I get to the case study, as I go forward again. I'm just gonna stop for a second. And I just wanted to know if anyone has any questions, if I spoke too quickly, if I missed something you would like to address. Cause again, I know ethical issues are going to be different depending on you know where you are. Um, so if there's anything somebody would like me to touch on or if anyone, any comments that somebody would have or if you actually just thought I was totally wrong, feel free to do that one too. Feel free to just open your mics and ask questions, get into discussions. And we can also do it in the end. As I understood, Julian, you have still have some slides, right? Or is yeah, there? Yeah, yeah. There's, I have a okay. couple of case studies that we can go through if people would like. Okay. Okay, that seems good. In that case, I shouldn't okay. have stopped the screen. So. So the first case is you're in the midst of scheduling a mediation. You reach out to the participants and tell them you take confidential confidentiality very seriously. So further emails are going to be end-to-end -end encrypted. For those who don't know what that means, it means that there's an additional password um, to open up that particular email. So I use it a lot. If I send something to a participant who has, again, just a general Gmail account, Hotmail, Outlook, something like that, when they get the email, they need another password that I will give them a phone and tell them, or I'll send, a, send them a message, usually not another email, um, and then they'll use that password to open it up. So it's an additional step. So you phone one of the parties to tell them what the password is so they can open it up. But the moment you do, they tell you that it sounds complicated, and that you should just send it normally, just 
through email like you normally would, no password, no end to end encryption, just normally. So my question is, what exactly do you do in this case? Um, actually, before I sort of give my feedback at all, I'd kind of like to know just what other people are thinking. Um, if I'm honest, I would probably just um, oblige, <laughs> send it to them normally, to be really honest with you. <clears throat> It does it would anyone else do that? I mean, honestly, it's really hard not to. Yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> really hard not to. <clears throat> I've had this situation on the other end being a client. And when I've said that, when I first started to use these types of emails, my clients just walk, uh, walked me through it. They just said, it's really easy. You just install this software and we'll do it online. And it was so they guided me through it to make it simple. And to take that kind of fear, this, this is a few years ago when I first started with these things. And um, for lawyers in particular, when you have um, financial data that's uh, confidential and um, if it leaked, it would lead to share price distortions. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I've been using it for a while. And as I say, at, at first I also said, oh, it sounds complicated, just send it to me normally. And it was they just talked me through the process. I've had to download software as well, um, protective software as well. That was sort of later, but in the initial days, it was, they just talked me through it and that helped. That's definitely the, that's good. Because <laughs> um, that is, again, this comes down to informed participant. And one of the things that gets kind of complicated is at what point is their self-determination and their informed participants are of status where they get to make the decisions. When is that in direct conflict with confidentiality? Um, you could argue maybe on a legal stance that you would, if they tell you not to do it, then, okay, you're in the clear um, because they told you, but ethically, I mean, the law is a bit of a minimum ethic. Um, so ethically, should you actually go forward with that? Personally, again, when I started, it was very much, okay, well, if you tell me that that's what you want, then okay. But now that I've explored some different technologies and, again, understand some of the risks that could come up when you're dealing with, I mean, if you're dealing with things that could lead to stock distortion, that's pretty gigantic. Um, but at the same time, I get a lot of documents that are tax forms that have the social insurance numbers of participants um, and every bit of information you would need to steal somebody's identity. Um, sending that sort of information without an additional form of protection is really important because you don't know where it's going. You don't know who you're sending it to, especially if it's information from the other party, because there's two parties involved. So the other question is, if somebody says that, do you go back and ask the original party who may have some information involved there what they want to do? Would anybody go back to the other party and sort of see if they're okay with it? Or would you just go back again with the idea of trying to talk somebody through it You just made my life a lot harder, first of all. Judy. I'm so sorry. <laughs> this, is, this is why people don't like ethicists. You tend to do things a lot. Right. So I would say there are relative, there are some technologies that are easier than others. I know a lot of law firms use programs where you actually need to download additional software or they don't give you the proper instructions and you kind of get stuck. Like last week I had one where it was working so badly they just ended up faxing it to me, which I needed to go to an office to find a fax machine because I, I'd never used a fax before. I didn't even really know how it worked to be totally honest with you, but that's what it essentially came down to. Um, but I use a email platform they're not paying me to say this. I'm just bringing it up because it's the one that I happen to use. It's called Tutanota. It's based in Germany, which is typically a good thing to think about because Germany has really strict cybersecurity laws. So a lot of the programs can- I can confirm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's always a good place to start. Always a good place to start. Um, 
And basically all it is, is a password. You don't need to download any other software. It's only the password. I send it to somebody, they put the password in and then it opens it up as a separate link. Um, that's just encrypted. So it's all they need is the password. It doesn't get much more complicated than that. Um, ideally, if everybody used the program, if you send it to somebody else who uses Tutanota as well, it's automatically all encrypted. So you don't actually need to do anything. But of course, nobody else uses it because it's not the most user-friendly thing. It doesn't have like a nice interface and it doesn't have the best user experience um, as most cybersecurity um, things typically don't have the best user experience. Um, but it is an important thing to do depending on the type of documents that are, you're sending. If it's just sort of scheduling or something, it's probably not that important. But again, if you're sending information that really needs to remain confidential, um, that that's important. And I do think going to the education side of walking somebody through it um, is is really what needs to be done. Because even if you go to the other party and you tell them, it's like, all right, they just want to use normal email. Do you want to just use normal email? And they both say yes. And this is where you end up running into an issue with informed consent. Like, do they actually understand the consequences? Or is this just an issue of the reality that the reason we love technology is because it's convenient. And the one thing cybersecurity does is make technology very inconvenient which isn't really an ethical reason not to do something, but it also kind of challenges a lot of our notions of what exactly technology is for. Um, so it's important that we try to shift our mindset a little bit um, to realize that while this is a little bit inconvenient, it is important because the last thing you really want to do is have to send out an email to your clients and say, hey, so my email has been compromised. Your data may be out there. You're going to want to make sure you take the steps to cover yourself. Um, and again, if somebody does get into your system, short of them actually using a ransomware attack, which is when they lock you out of your account and tell you to pay them, and that's the only way you're going to get any of your information back, the other thing they can do is come into your account and you have no idea they're there and they just take your data and there's no way to know. Um, which again, why it's important to either use, either change up your passwords regularly or use two-factor authentication. Again, I'm gonna try not to turn this into sort of a tech lecture idea, um, but there are things you need to consider when it comes to that, just because somebody could be in your email and you don't know. Um, so taking these sort of precautions is important because especially if they're in and if you work with somebody like a law firm, what a lot of hackers do is they get into one system to jump to the next. It's one of the reasons law firms are such big targets is because they have big clients. And if they can't get to the law firm themselves, I mean, a mediator may be a good go between get into the mediator who has contact with the law firm, they get into the law firm, then they get into the bigger clients. Um, so all of these things are very connected. Is there, trying to figure out if there's any more, is there anything else, anybody, any thoughts anyone has about this case? Julian, there is a, a question in the oh. chat. Could you please put the name of the software in the chat? Oh yeah, that works. I'm gonna, I'll do that, to be honest. Speaking of confidence in the technology, can I do that while I'm screen sharing or not? Oh. Yes, you should be able to, you should be able to. See the chat button somewhere. It's at the bottom of the screen, oh, yeah, right in yeah, the middle. Yeah. yeah. Got it. Guys, yeah, he's speaking of confidence. <laughs> so that's Tutanota. That's the email I use. Again, these are just ones that I happen to use. There are a lot of different options out there. Um, I would say if I just had to throw out some of the basics, using a VPN, a virtual private network, is also good. Um, those are starting to become more popular now. Um, I mean, what's the one? Nord VPN is one of the big ones. Um, I actually use one. Okay, I'm just going to put this in too.
basically what that does is it hides your low, it, someone can't trace your IP address, um, which makes it a lot easier for them not to get personal information from you. That's probably less important from the strict mediation point of view, but it is important in terms of just generally general security for yourself when you're online. Okay. Okay. So I'm gonna move on to the next case study. Which is this, you're beginning to schedule a mediation and one of the parties wants it held virtually, but the other has a very slow inter internet connection and is hesitant. They know that a, a video will lag significantly. They're hesitant, but they still wanna go forward. What do you do in that sort of situation? Or what are some thoughts? That's super annoying. And obviously, um, I think it's a more, you know, the finances of the situation come into play here because obviously you don't want to kind of reschedule the mediation session because you've got to pay for the mediator perhaps and your time and rescheduling the whole thing anyway is a bit of a nightmare. So, but again, I don't know, depending on how bad it is, I may just cancel it and reschedule, but I would do anything to kind of persevere with that mediation, if honest with you. Let's get it done. Yeah. Anybody else? Is it possible to then switch to something like WhatsApp and suggest that if, if it's so important to have the video element, that I've done that before, mm. um, so that if both people have enough uh, Wi-Fi to use that, or we could you could make it into a phone conference and then you don't see mm. people. But if both people are on the same media as it were and uh both uh, you only hear the voice then that makes it fair and equal i guess yeah that would be addressing the potential power dynamic <clears throat> while also sacrificing some of the quality of the mediation but what keeps things more balanced and this also assumes that this is how we're used to needing to do everything virtually that we are now is you know maybe when this is done and everyone's vaccinated we could actually see if people would want to be willing to see each other in person um because even if once one of them wants it held virtually, but another one wants to potentially do it in person, depending on where you are in the world, um, there always could be the arrangement that you do it half and half. Um, at the first, at the first lull we sort of had um, in in COVID numbers in Canada, I did one that was half and half um, when we were allowed to be in the same room together, but very far apart. Um, we went in, set something up so that one party still did it virtually because that's what they felt comfortable with. The other party was on the far side of a very large table. And then I was on the other side of a very large table. Um, so there is always the opportunity to do the mix. Um, again, you need to plan that one through. Video, I mean, sorry, phone call uh, definitely keeps the power balance, but also limits the ability to actually really see what's going on and see what the person's doing. Um, there are ways to sort of try to help with video lag, but unfortunately that usually involves doing something like turning off the video, which at that point is no different than the phone call. Um, and then there's also just hoping things go better than anticipated. Um, because in a lot of mediations, the thing is you go in and the person has no idea that they're going to be a lot of lag. Maybe they were downloading a big, big video. Maybe they forgot to pay their bill. Um, and or have already maxed out, you know, their their bandwidth for the month. Um, and then it just starts lagging. So how about if this was in the middle of a mediation and that exact thing starts happening? There's just so much lag, you can barely get something done. Um, what would you do at that point? Or any thoughts about what you would do? Well, would you be able to just have them phone in the number so even though they're on video and it's lagging at least you can hear them clearly on the phone yeah that would be a really good option that way you wouldn't need to cancel the mediation and start all over again but then at least they'd be able to still share their story i think if you were actually if you called in too there's the potential that you could call in while still sort of staying on the video and if they muted themselves then at least you'd still be able to see their face on and off, but you'd still have a clear audio, which kind of could help balance things out. Cause even then the, at least you see them, um, which yeah. would keep the visual component, um, but the audio, which would be clear. 
I've had to do that on a few occasions where uh, the, the, the mic has dropped out and we just kind of done it like a hands-free kind of setup. I can see their lips moving and everything. It's exactly the same, essentially. Yeah. It's not coming from your PC, so that works fine. Yeah, yeah, so that's a good way to sort of adapt. Yeah. Any other thoughts? Um, yes, um, if you don't mind, just a quick one. Um, looking at the same case study, case study two, in this case, um, it says that they know the video will lag significantly, but still want to forward with the mediation. What if you have a situation where um, the parties are actually requesting for an adjunct session, but the mediator insists on going ahead. How do you deal with that? And how do you relate ethics with this? Well, if the mediator is actually sort of saying, yeah, we need to go ahead with this. Yes, but the parties are in agreement as to having um, an adjunct session. Well, that would because make it non voluntary. That would make it non voluntary at that point, wouldn't yeah. it? Yeah. So it would have to be a. That would have had to come from, I guess, a mandatory mediation program, right? I didn't quite get that. Oh, sorry. So, um, be because man uh, mediations are typically voluntary. Yes. You're, if, if you're the mediator, you typically don't have the authority to force any sort of mediation. Um, exactly. And unless through something like a mandatory mediation program. Um, okay. If you have Ontario and you have some other places where if you're in a civil, or at least in Ontario, if you're in a civil case, you have to do mediation within 90 days of um, yes. starting the case. So in, in that sort of situation, that's again, somewhere where the mediator would have to have the competency to make adaptations. I would not use a mediator who, who, even in a mandatory mediation setting, decided that they had the right to force something. Through <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. You, you really shouldn't use that mediator. Okay, certainly. I mean, yeah. because I, I mean, I asked that question because I had seen a similar scenario um, where something like this happened and the parties ended up in court because at the end of the day, they weren't quite prepared to go on with that session. Um, so I just wanted to hear your thoughts on that. So thank you very much. Yeah, not a problem. Yeah, it gets it gets hard, especially if it's in the middle of a mediation session and get, things get so bad that the parties are just put their hands up and think they're, and just say they're done with it. Um, but as a mediator, even if you really want to get things going and get through and get, get through it, um, it's, it's up to the parties. I mean, even in a mandatory mediation setting, it's still up to them whether or not they really want something to work or not. Um, you can't force somebody through a mediation. Um, Definitely, I, I agree with that. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's Hi. a hand up. Can I ask a small question? Uh, this I'm a Pasna Singh from India, and uh, just we were discussing uh, a case study where this the particular case study on the screen that when the internet connection goes slow, uh, one of the parties internet connection goes slow, then we can change the uh, medium original medium on which the mediation was taking place. Uh, will not that uh, compromise the confidentiality of the process? Because uh, on a <laughs> Uh, phone conference as in phone uh, uh, mediation going on on a phone call or WhatsApp, isn't that uh, uh, something uh, which the mediator should worry with regards to confidentiality? It's something or you definitely mediation? have to be aware of, especially if you switch to something like WhatsApp, you'd have to make sure that it's as secure as, as something like Zoom. Um, I mean, unfortunately, the security of a lot of the video platforms right now isn't fantastic. Um, mm -hmm. We just don't have access. So one of, one of the big questions that's going to be coming up in terms of the fourth party in the future is we start developing our own mediation-specific programs, um, or at least in the law world where there is a lot more emphasis on cybersecurity. We all jump to Zoom, but there's a lot 
of problems there. There are some gaps in actually being able to keep that confidential. So unfortunately, in terms of shifting platform, none of yeah. them are fantastic. Um, you're, you're not necessarily going to be able to ensure as much confidential, confidentiality as you would like, given mm -hmm. the ones that are available now. Um, I would say Zoom's probably the best. WhatsApp has made me nervous ever since they partnered with Facebook. I will be totally honest with you. Um, I know they've sort of covered themselves after the, everyone started leaving to move to various different other platforms. Um, but it's, it's maybe I'm just biased at this point when it comes to it, but I just try to stay away from anything Facebook related if I'm worried about confidentiality. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anything else? No. All right. So I'm actually going to open this up a little bit um, just to see if there are any particular ethical issues anybody's come across um, that they'd sort of like to talk out or aren't sure about, or maybe after this have sort of realized there was an ethical issue that came up that maybe they weren't really aware of at the time. Um, May I ask a question? Yeah, for um, sure. What What do you do if somebody gets really upset on a Zoom call? Um, and then you have a technical problem with it as well. So. Oh, yeah. That's just two things at once. That... Yeah, I've never had that happen. I've had it happen with a child before online, and um, it's very tricky. That is difficult. Yeah. Yeah. Um, have especially you because experienced it? I haven't. I've actually had people recently, people have been on very good behavior and I don't want to jinx it. Uh, I have noticed that, especially when frustrations get high, when the technology starts going wrong, is it, it just exacerbates everything um, on all ends. Part of me, when somebody starts going on a rant, when they're really angry over Zoom and you just can't sort of get to them, depending on the content. I mean, I always open up my mediations and just say that this is, you have to be respectful. Um, you have to, even though these are very heated and emotional moments, you have to treat each other with respect and you know, emotions are naturally gonna come up, but as long as it stays without the respectful realm, within the respectful realm, that's, that's okay. Um, again, within reason, because a lot of times, just as in person, a lot of times people need to vent, they need to get that out. Um, I think maybe I would shift to a breakout room. Um, if it, it was getting to the point where it was just like too emotional, that it was sort of, I needed to separate people, check how one party was doing with um, all of the emotion and then check with the other one to see how they're doing um, with just getting it out there, what did they need to start feeling heard and whatnot. Um, if it did start getting disrespectful, the same way you could potentially shut down a mediation that was in person, I think I'd be okay with just muting them. Um, if it was getting to the point where they're just getting really offensive, offensive, um, I would be okay with that. And then again, go into the breakout rooms and just Again, clear it up, just say, listen, we can't have that, go to the other side and ask if they want to continue or not. Um, because naturally when that sort of thing happens, the other party, it, you need to make sure everything stays balanced, right? Um, but that is one of the techniques that I think is actually kind of nice about Zoom, but we don't want to get too used to doing just being able to mute people um, if, if things get really bad. But again, I would, I would save that for if things are disrespectful um, otherwise, I think breakout rooms are fantastic for being able to just take people aside and having a having a good conversation. Thank um, you. I want to ask: um, Are there any kind of uh, applications or video software you'd probably recommend you don't use because of ethical reasons or due to ethical reasons? I, I mean. Gen the popular things typically aren't great. Um, yeah. And the popular ones are also exactly what hackers are going to target. Um, so if you use 
I mean, I have a Gmail account, but that's for personal stuff and, you know, mm. other things that are less important. And then I have the Tutanota account just for mediations. Right, right. Or professional stuff. Because then it's like, there, there's less chances. I get less emails there. They're all just, there's less chances of something happening. Um, and then use it. Yeah, it, it's honestly more about shoring up what you can get to the best of your ability. Um, recognizing that it's never going to be perfect. I mean, sure. again, as things advance, we're never going to be able to secure things online the way we would just taking something and putting it into like a locked drawer. Yeah. It's never going to be that. And it's just going to get more difficult because I mean, once quantum computing picks up, even encryption is going to be pointless. Um, and I honestly, I have no idea what's going to happen at that point. <laughs> I'm sure um, they'll figure something. Yeah, they'll, they'll figure something out. Like right. always, it's, it's always going to be this ongoing battle back and forth yeah. um, and just trying to keep some sort of um, awareness of what the current standards are. So I'm, I'm hoping that probably when the bigger reports come out on this, um, particularly the one with Mediate.com, because they're, they have the group of people who are like the most involved with ODR from the beginning. Um, so I think their report is going to be pretty comprehensive. Um, that will probably set some reasonable standards of what exactly we should expect from ourselves. Um, because I know for me, the thing that got me into this was in part paranoia because one of my friends started working <laughs> in cybersecurity and he just started telling me all of the problems that were going on. And I just that same day went in and just changed things I would save on the cloud. I would encrypt my entire computer. I got this new email <laughs> thing. I, got, I just went through and changed everything um purely out of that so i know i always need to temper myself a bit because i know i go a little bit too far um I, I don't need to do everything that i do um so i think it is there are there is a basis of things i think we need to consider just to be careful but i mean again what what's considered reasonable is still sort of up in the air at the moment um, but we also can't be so hard on ourselves that we um just keep beating ourselves up every single thing that we do. Sure. Thanks, Julia. Nice one. Thank you. Thanks. Is there anything else? Any, yeah. I, think, yeah. I think Barati had a question about Facebook in the chat. Um, oh. She said, um, do you think login into Zoom with Facebook takes care of confidentiality? Don't log into Zoom with Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, don't, um, don't do that. It's generally what I would say is anything that says log into this using your Google account, using your Facebook account, using any of the accounts, I would highly recommend against that. Um, because the more your accounts are linked, the easier it is for if once someone breaks into one of them, they can get into everything. Um, and again, people can do a lot of stuff in the background and not really um, let you know that they're doing it, which is a serious problem. So it's better to keep everything separate to the best of your ability. Um, again, that's the reason I have a very particular business account that I have things connected to, and I don't use my personal one. I don't use um, other I just don't keep everything connected. Um, it's better to kind of break everything up to the best of your ability. Um, there are password, um, there are password programs that are pretty good. I use one called Keeper. I'll put this into the password again or the chat again. Oops. It's a password manager and it's also a cloud drive. Um, Keeper is a password manager. Uh, yeah. Yeah, Keeper. Keeper. Keeper is a password manager. Okay. Thank you so much. No problem. It's good. Um, and I've been using that because while cloud software is really bad or it has a reputation of being a problem for saving a lot of things. Um, it's always better to use an external hard drive, an encrypted external hard drive for your files. Um, for smaller things, I'll use Keeper because it is more um, secure, far more secure. And then it also helps you remember and create passwords. If it does, obviously most of these things cost a little bit of money, not too much. 
um, for Keeper, you can actually, if you add a bit more, they have this thing called Breach Watch, which monitors the dark web. And if it knows your passwords, it will tell you if one of your passwords and usernames show up on the dark web, which is also a, a good thing to have. Um, and it's really easy just to keep everything as complicated a password as you want. And you don't need to, you know, I'll still write them down, but for the most part, if you have the password uh, manager, then it can just input. Um, again, it, it'll offer the sort of attachments that go with Chrome that you can use. Um, typically, I still try to keep it separate. Um, when you are, if you don't want to use a password keeper, but and you just want to make like a stronger password yourself, think of length. I know everyone always emphasizes the symbols and the different numbers and all of that, which is important. Um, but the length is like the most important thing. Uh, so definitely think length um, for, for really, again, with a password keeper, it's good because you can just choose how long. I have some passwords that are 50 characters long and use different symbols, numbers and letters and capitalize it like, as complicated as it can possibly get. Um, I also actually mentioned that Basically, every other comment has come up about other options for encrypted email. So Proton Mail, Anne's been throwing some up, like Dashlane. Those are also really good. Um, those are really good programs. I've always wondered, um, with, with the uh, password keepers, though, what happens if you lose your password yeah. to the password keeper? I've always been a bit worried about letting something else generate a password for me. Same I'm here. always going to forget it straight away. Yeah. So this this is this is the problem. Right. All all cybersecurity things will have is because a lot of the times part of their security measure is that they won't remember your password and that it's really hard for you to change your password because that in and of itself would limit your ability that it would kind of make you more vulnerable. Right. Um, so usually what will happen is you choose the password and then you just have to write it down physically somewhere okay, um, and just have it on you somewhere and pray that something doesn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, my thing, of course, now I'm hesitant to actually, all right, I'm going to say this and just hope that nobody's secretly listening in, but this is where my own paranoia is kicking in. <laughs> what, what I have historically done is it's so easy to remember your own name, your own date of birth, your own whatever, and that's why people use it so much. What I will do is I will take an obscure friend from kindergarten who nobody knows I'm even thinking about anymore, but I remember their birthday, I remember their last names, I remember all of that, and I use that information. Because if I remember that person, I know all of that. And that way it's the sort of still the same premise of what helps me remember it, um, and then I'll just throw in, uh, again, just relevant numbers or something. But for anyone to guess that, they would need to have a lot more insight into what's going on to my, in my head than, or my history than I could possibly imagine. And the reality is if somebody was going to find out that I was thinking particularly about this person from that long ago, I mean, they're going to get into any system I do. I'm not even, I mean, they're... <laughs> they're in. I can't even be upset at that point if they're going to put that much. <laughs> I would actually just say also uh, two-factor authentication is really important. Um, so if somebody does, um, for anyone like someone who doesn't know that, you put in your password, but then you also get a message, um, whether it's through email or text or um, a particular app, app that creates um, the codes. And then you put in that code as well. And what that means is that if somebody gets your password and tries to log into your account, they need the second thing too, that again is totally disconnected. And you'll usually get a heads up about it, sort of saying like, hey, someone's trying to do this. Do you want them in? And you can stop them right there. And then it also gives you a warning about whether or not you need to change your password up right at that moment. Um, I would avoid using the text message option because it, it has been known that some people will use the text message option for their bank account and the person intercepts the text message and then uses the code. And even though you have two factor authentication, they still break it. Um, the best way is if you actually get one of the apps, one of the two factor authentication apps that creates codes every minute, basically. 
and then you log, you just sort of open up that app when you do two-factor two authentication that links to um, whatever platform you're using. And that's the safest way to do it. The trick with that, again, in terms of the limits is that you have the app on your phone. If you lose your phone, you might be in a little bit of trouble. Try not to lose your phone. <laughs> um, but again, it's the, it's the most secure in terms of actually getting that second factor authentication. Um, other than that, I, I typically get, they'll give you the option of, if you do the text message route, uh, the other option is phoning. I'll usually go the phone route because it's harder to intercept like the phone call than it would be the text message. Um, yes, that would be the other the other point because that would be another thing that just you should really have two factor authentication set up as just a basic. Julian, I feel I feel slightly nervous now. <laughs> after. Sorry, it's sort of not. I'm kind of hoping that's that feeling I mentioned at the beginning. You know that that gut feeling that something needs to be done. After the session, it was it is very very helpful, and I think it's absolutely um, worth it. Think about it, and especially if we deal with data from other person, right? As we do in mediation. Um, is there any other questions? I'm asking you a little bit over the time, but like uh, I would say one or two questions we could still take in. No, okay. Julian, thank you very much. And I would like to invite you to have a next webinar. And I want to discuss uh, <laughs> with you about the topic. I have something in mind that is connected with um, the um, cybersecurity um, part of it and also the technology part of it. I mean, I know that there exists some kind of uh, platforms for mediation already. And um, just to discuss again, like the technical part of um, Zoom or different platforms, what are the advantages? Advantage, disadvantages. I think that it, it would be very good to hear more expertise on that. I felt that, and also looking at your question, that this is something that we not really is not really in our focus, or at least not like in 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 the focus of the ones who started just with dealing with the cyber online mediation and concentrating a lot about the dynamics uh, on it, like meaning the communication dynamics, but there is this technical part that is very interesting also. So I guess there will be a follow-up. 